Hi BookTube, I'm Scott and today I'm going to review all the books I read for Nonfiction November. Uh, I just want to say if you're new here, thank you for watching, hit that subscribe button, uh, like and at the end of the video let us know what you thought of any of these books. Did you agree or disagree with my opinion? Uh, so I read 11 books and DNF'd 7 books for Nonfiction November. So I'm going to really rip through the 7 books I uh, DNF'd quickly. Organic Marxism by Philip Clayton. Uh, I got about three quarters of the way through this and I didn't realize, uh, I, I didn't understand what organic Marxism was. So at no point did was that conversation had. DNF. Uh, the Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Seacole in Mary Land, Many Lands by Mary Seacole. Uh, I just did not like this. I found Mary Seacole to be very dismissive of other people. So I, I just, just didn't like it so I moved on. Um, a Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. Um, one of the things with non-fiction is that either you know about a topic or you don't know about a topic and it's much more interesting to learn new things than it is to be told things you already know and that's where Bill Bryson failed in his novel and I DNF'd it pretty early on. Uh, Beyond Good and Evil by Frederick Nietzsche. Um, to be honest, don't really remember much about this novel. Thought he sounded like a bit of a dick. Don't really know if that's true. Um, Psychedelic Medication, The Healing Power of LSD, MDMA, Suicidum by Richard Lewis Miller. Um, this book was dumbing down overly technical things that we're talking about like the angle of intersection between molecules and stuff and the shape of molecules and I really just did not think you needed to include that to have this discussion and if you did you certainly didn't need to dumb it down uh, at all so I, I really felt like who were you aiming this at because by dumbing it down, you actually made it harder for me to follow what you were saying. And uh, so I ended up DNFing that because the writing was just terrible. They didn't understand who their market was. Um, LSD, The Mind, The Universe, Diamonds from Heaven. So two LSD books. Um, this one I DNFed as soon as I heard the line that he was discussing various trips. And I heard the line... Of course, we'll never have the same trip. There's the planetary position factor as well. And I thought, if you think that the quality of your trip depends on where the Earth is in its cycle around the sun, you're whacked. So I, uh, I decided not to read any more of that book just then. Finally, Walden by Henry David Thoreau. I mean, there were some lovely words in this. I have no idea what they mean he didn't say anything uh, I don't know what the point of this was I don't even know if this is non-fiction like it was just words on a page lovely sentences that meant nothing uh, there wasn't a person mentioned by the time I DNF'd this there wasn't a topic mentioned it was just descriptions of stuff so I moved on maybe this is poetry I don't know but all right, the first book I read for the month is Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind by Yuro Noah Harari. Um, this was a fantastic book. This sort of took us uh, from like the birth of humanity, like, um, you know, like Homo erectus evolving into Homo sapien. Uh, you know, our conflict with Neanderthals, our developing of, of art, our developing of society, our developing of civilization, our domestication of animals, and so on and so forth, and just took us through society and took us through how it worked and just examined so many interesting, interesting things. Um, uh, I really do highly recommend this book. One of the issues I had with this book is looking back at it now, it has blended with two other books I read by Jared 
diamond on the same topic. I don't think that's a big issue. All three of these books that I'm going to talk about are fascinating and, and highly recommend the read. Um, this one, to distinguish it from those uh, two books, this one sort of finished with a theoretical discussion about where humanity was going. It talked about things like um, amputees putting on robot arms that they could control. It talked about uploading human conscious to the internet. It talked about what is humanity. It talked about how much longer are we going to be human say whom human sapiens, homo sapiens for. Um, and I just, I, I just, this was super interesting, highly recommended. I gave it four stars. I'm, I'm a real pedant with my stars though. Um, and yeah, um, let's go and talk about those two Jared Diamond books, even though they're out of order. Um, the third chimpanzee is the next one uh, I read. Its subtitle is The Evolution and Future of the Human Animal. And again, it discusses basically the same things as Sapien. Um, it's slightly better, uh, is really it. it. It answered a few more questions. Uh, I really appreciated uh, Diamond's... Um, Diamond's use of linguistics and and how he was able to use that and and produce arguments that I was really happy to follow with. I found it fascinating. Some of the things he he pointed out he he pointed out how Malaysian people had to be on ships uh, almost a thousand years ago because if you look at the language that the people of Madagascar speak that it is a Malaysian language and not an African language. So the people of Malaysia had to have somehow colonized the island of Madagascar. Also, the other thing that he did is he looked at the banana crop and it's from Malaysia as well, but it's all over Africa. So how did it get there? So some of this stuff that he did was just fascinating and interesting. Uh, I gave this one five stars. It was absolutely excellent. Um, again, looking back on it, it blurred. And I also read Guns, Germs and Steel, The Fate of Human Society by Jared Diamond. Uh, this started off by posing, posing the question, why did the Spanish invade the Incas? Why didn't the Incas invade the Spanish? Not just from a, like, look at how Spain was at the time and look at how the Incas were, but how did Spain get to a position that it was going to invade the Incas? Why didn't the Incas have ships that went to Spain and invaded Spain? Like, what what were the contributing factors? What made those societies so different? Why did they evolve at different rates? Why did the European one get to get to sailing across the whatever sea it is first, <laughs> the Atlantic first? Um, and this covered a lot of the same topics as the the chimpanzee and as sapiens. Um, and again, it was brilliant. I would have rated this book five stars, but my star rating is about enjoyment for me. Uh, and I didn't enjoy this book as much as The Third Chimpanzee simply because I read it second. And The Third Chimpanzee had taught me new stuff where with Guns, Germs and Steel's repeated stuff that The Third Chimpanzee had already taught me. So I felt like, uh, you know, like, but as far as anybody else's reading is concerned as long as you haven't read the third chimpanzee guns germs and steel is just as good and it may be even better maybe you don't want to read those books back to back maybe you want to have a 12 months gap so then guns germs and steels refreshes it anyway i really recommend all three of those books the writing is just amazing the arguments are crisp there's no charlatanism that is sometimes available in you know journalists writing scientific books often you know don't get it wrong we need good scientific communicators it's a it's an excellent skill and i thought these these three books uh were absolutely excellent and they were worth participating in non-fiction november alone any one of those books were worth participating in non-fiction november alone uh how to change your mind by michael Pollan. what the new science of psychedelics teaches us um so you know the two books i dnf'd about lsd were written by rubbish people and then i i didn't actually know much about this book 
um, I actually just saw it. it was Michael Pollan. It was called How to Change Your Mind. I thought it was about like turning conservatives into liberals or something like that or vice versa. Like I thought it was it was about the human mind and about our ideas. But I was judging a book on its name and it was about LSD. Um, and I was considering DNFing this book straight away, but it was Michael Pollan and Michael Pollan is a good writer and, and, and we know that. So I gave it a chance and I'm really glad I did. It was super interesting. It was really fair. It wasn't hippy dippy. It, it really did explain it well. And you know, good nonfiction writers, you can, you can really see the discrepancy between a good one and a bad one, can't you? Um, this was just fascinating. It talked about things like LSD and how it could be used as a mental health thing, how giving patients LSD when they're terminally ill can give their life meaning. It talked about a lot of the visions that people get and how they think that they've interacted with something profound. And, and then it talked about what's actually going on in their brain. It asked if they did or if they didn't. Uh, Michael Poland then did those drugs um, to see if they changed his mind on that. Um, and it was just fascinating. And one of the things it, it just pointed out was that people who take LSD seem to think that their life has more meaning and it makes them happier. So while that could be a lie, they're happier at the end of that. So why is that a problem? And especially for terminally ill patients, you, you know, you're reducing the anxiety of these patients about dying and, and you're making them feel like their life has meaning. That's so nice. So uh, I really enjoyed those arguments that Poland put forward. Uh, uh, four stars for this novel. Highly recommend this novel as well. Very good novel. So depart despite all the DNFs, I actually got some really good novels uh, in novels, books, nonfiction can't be a novel. The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot. Let's do that again. The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot. This is a nonfiction book about Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks uh, donated, not, uh, donated is the wrong word. Uh, she had a sample taken from her of a cancerous growth on her cervix or in her uterus, uh, I think. Uh, and that cancerous growth continued to grow and grow and grow and grow. And the hospital that took that growth, uh, without her permission, which was pretty standard at the time, um, then proceeded to give it away and now vials of these cells they're called healer cells now uh are selling for you know 25 dollars a vial and they're used in all sorts of medical research it's, they were blown up in the atomic bomb they're used in cloning they went to the moon they're super important cells they're regenerative regenerative human cells it's really interesting Henrietta Lacks was a black woman and Rebecca, Rebecca Skloot wanted to find out more about her. What I really thought was going to be an interesting discussion on biology and science turned out to be an interesting discussion on racism and the health system in the US and why it's terrible. Um, this was really surprising because every like it just it went down so many different turns and and um it's just, it's just it just didn't go where i wanted it to go but i really enjoyed this novel uh and i really recommend this novel again i'm using the word novel um i really enjoyed this book i really do recommend this book but um it, it's not about science it's about race it's about health it's about whether you own your cells or whether the doctor who takes your cells owns them. It's you know, like intellectual property of your own body and stuff like that. Um, and, and then again, it all comes back to racism as well. So um, very good, highly recommend this one. This was fascinating. Um, to continue with good books, um, misquoting Jesus by Bart D. Ehrman. Um, 
So this is a book that details how the Bible has changed in our times. Um, this book sort of, you know, things that you don't know, like, cause in today's society, you can go onto project Gutenberg, download a version of the Bible, send it to a printing press and you've got your own version of the Bible, but, and, and like it gets copied without a single error. But in the years after Jesus died, the people who were copying the gospels were often people who couldn't read, but could write. That was the level of literacy you had. On top of that, you had things like they didn't use punctuation or spaces. So I'll put an example up here of a string of letters and that could mean two different things. Um, you then you had it translated. Then the idea that the text had to be the same was not preserved uh, the the idea that it had to um that the meaning was more important came through um so you know sometimes the scribes would actually deliberately change what was in there to try and clarify something that they felt was written badly or, or whatever um then there was another example where um a two-sided piece of paper was used where uh, there was an opricon on one side, which is, which side, it's a Greek um, O basically. Um, and then a bit of ink bled through and it turned the opricon into a theta, completely changed the meaning of the word, completely changed um, a certain aspect of Christianity. And it's something that is still followed today. So it was super interesting there um probably a little bit too much time spent on how these changes are made and what the changes were um most of the changes i mean most of the time the most of the changes are literally essentially typos and and they get fixed but sometimes the changes aren't typos sometimes they don't get fixed and you know sometimes you have different scrolls and stuff from different regions saying different things when they're copies of the same gospel so super interesting um i thought it was very respectful to religion but i am an atheist so probably not the best judge of that um but you know the influence of the bible and how it's changed over the years is fascinating um so far, I've only reviewed books that I've hated or books that I have loved. So let's review, uh, let's review the, the weaker books. Um, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It with Gary Tables. Um, this was uh, a book about weight and about people being overweight or underweight or whatever and, and the mechanisms behind that. Um, this was thought provoking and definitely encouraged me to do some research. The problem is that Gary Tubes or Tubbs or whatever, however you say his name, is clearly a hack journalist, clearly doesn't really research his thing, clearly has confirmation bias, except that he's clearly stumbled upon something that's right. And then he's only looking for further proof that it's right. So we have this like problem here. Um, he basically argues that uh, people gain weight not because they overeat or under exercise, but because they have too much insulin in their blood. Uh, and he then argues that to get rid of insulin, you should cut carbs and essentially argues for cutting carbs, sometimes as far as cutting fruit and vegetables completely from your diet. Um, the problem with that is sorry the other thing that he argues is don't don't bother exercising um so that's all like that's the atkins diet really isn't it um now the problem with this is um when you do some research on things that lower insulin you'll find that exercise lowers insulin you'll find that certain fruits and veg lower insulin you'll find that low gi foods lower insulin and they're all contradicted by like it's it's just that he he doesn't understand what he is advising properly so he is he has pointed out that 
the doctor that you go to, if you wanted to lose weight and you go to the doctor, which you're encouraged to do in Australia, I don't know about any other else, but I certainly know that when you go to the doctor and they want to treat you for something that they'll tell you to lose weight straight away when you're overweight uh, and then they'll give you advice and often that advice is ridiculously used like like often that advice is like oh you've got dirty hands wash your hands sort of level dumb like you know um and so it was nice to hear about that but ultimately he just he just got it wrong and it was really clear that he got it wrong and you could probably google this stuff certainly blaming a hormonal imbalance rather than uh overeating and that was, is certainly the way to go but um yeah yeah just just not right um braiding sweet grass by robin wall kimmer now i know that lots of people have read this book lots of people have loved this book i did not love this book uh i gave it two stars oh by the way i gave the fat book three stars uh because i did um anyway i gave this one i gave braiding sweet grass two stars why did i give it two stars i loved what it was talking about it was sort of talking about how we can learn stuff from native americans it was talking about how you, you know like we, we basically as westerners we don't listen enough to indigenous people we sort of assume we know best about everything and we dismiss them and basically we really should listen to them and and it will be beneficial to us we can learn stuff from them and not only was she arguing for that but she was telling us examples of what we could learn the problem i had with this norm with this book was it just it took so long to say what it was saying what it was saying was very obvious from the start and i was just i was really bored um i agree with the message i i don't disagree with it i don't find anything she said offensive i just thought that she could have said it in about 10 percent of the words so i didn't like it um you maybe love this book um you maybe need to maybe it takes more convincing for you to come around to this point of view than it does for me maybe you know I, I, I really think that there's a lot of good to be had at this book. Personally, I didn't enjoy it. Personally, I found it slow and boring. But I really do think that this is a good book. Uh, I don't know. Sorry, that's wrong. I really do think that the message in this book is valuable and that Wall Kimmer's arguments are worthwhile exploring. So uh, I would probably listen to the people who say it's good even though I didn't enjoy it. The Unwomanly Face of War by... Whoops! <laughs> by Svetlana Alexandrovich. Um, I am not going to hold that up because apparently I can't. Um, I'm, ne I'm yet to rate this book. Uh, I don't know how to rate this book. This book was a depiction of women who went to war for the USSR in World War II. Uh, it gave them their story. Uh, I say women, but I really should say girls because they were mostly young. Um, it basically was repeating the voices. There was very little work. I one of my biggest problems with this is that why why do you put your name on it what did what did svetlana alexandrovich what did you do in order to to put your name on this because as far as i can see everything is just a word for word manuscript copied of people that you spoke to you know i uh, just I, uh, like the recorder was on you wrote it down it was fascinating to listen to it wasn't put in any order it wasn't like you know a lot of these women got their period for the first time on the front it wasn't like all those stories were put together it wasn't like all the stories where people were dying were put together 
It wasn't like there was commentary on it. There was nothing. It was just their voices. And that's important. But, um, you know, there are other nonfiction books that are collections of essays that are, uh, are essentially people giving their voices and there's no author's name on it. And I'm not really sure why Svetlana Alexandrovich put her name on the book. I don't know what she added. Um, so, uh, but, you know, you talk about how young these women were. You're talking about women that some of them were taking like stuffed animals, like dolls and stuff onto the front line. We're also talking about some of these women like left important war jobs in like communications and spying and stuff in order to fight, fight on the front line because that's where they wanted to be. Like that sort of ridiculous patriotism to the cause. Um, so it was very interesting to hear that. Um, but as a book, it, it's a bad book, but it's a very interesting subject matter. So yeah. Um, now this one we buddy read, Nell and I buddy read this with Kim from K Becker books. Nell has not finished this book yet. Uh, I don't know whether she plans to finish it or not. Um, but yeah, we, and, and that for me, the highlight of this book was, uh, was chatting to Kim and finding out about her mum burning down her oven, burning down an oven. Yeah. Uh, so, and various other stories. Uh, and I do think if, if you, uh, are friends with Kim on, uh, booktube, uh, try and do a buddy read with her because she's a first class person. All right. I think I've got two to go these were probably my two favorites for the um for the month um the omnivores dilemma by michael Pollan um is a book that really traces where food comes from it traces it in america if i'm to criticize this book at all it's that i live in australia and a lot of the information in this book uh, I, I, we work, Nell and I both run a grocery delivery business. We, we pick up produce from farms as part of our jobs. We talk to farmers. Um, we were quite involved in the food chain. And a lot of the criticism of the American food chain doesn't apply to the Australian food chain. Um, and, and a great example is our conventionally grown food. So our non-organic food or, you know, um, the fertilizers used in that is often um chicken poo uh, but in the us it is synthetic fertilizers anyway it doesn't really matter that that is my um criticism because essentially what poland is doing is he is looking at a food system at its most destructive and worst He's looking at his food system at its most natural. And he's looking at the problems that we have with our food system and like, what is the best solution? Where does food come from? How do we feed enough people? You know, if we go for a carbon neutral approach, how is that going to affect us? How are we going to be able to grow enough food? Um, but there's just some of the things he says in here is just fascinating. He had um, a McDonald's cheeseburger meal. I don't know what's in a cheeseburger meal in the US, in Australia. If you got a cheeseburger meal, it would be something you gave to a child. Uh, but in Australia, a cheeseburger and in the US, a cheeseburger are slightly different things. So um, I don't, uh, I, not that they're very different, but uh, anyway, he said, he traced where all the food came from. And, and I mean, like, if you accept that beef, you know, it's, it's obviously a cow, but the thing that grows the cow is what the, the cow eats. So it's grass or corn. Um, so he traced the source of everything how it was like what it what its original thing was from essentially what was the plant that trapped the sunlight to build the food uh, and it was 57 percent corn in his happy burger meal which is 
Happy Burger. Um, his cheeseburger meal, which is weird because one of like you would have thought potatoes would have been high because there's chips. You would have thought wheat would have been high because it's bread, but actually corn went one so yeah fascinating and then he went to the other end he went to super organic he went to local um he criticized the organic industry he praised the organic industry it was really fascinating and something that everybody should read about where your food comes from probably the other most interesting fact was that so a calorie is actually a unit of energy so he said when you eat one calorie of lettuce it takes enough it takes energy to get that to you to grow it to harvest it to package it to take it to the shops and so on and so forth so he got the least efficient organic farming and he said that one calorie of lettuce took 60 calories of fossil fuel to get from uh, from where it was grown in Salinas to his plate in New York. Um, and it was like, he's like, that's clearly unsustainable. It should take us less than one calorie of energy to grow one calorie of energy. Otherwise we're going backwards. Um, yeah. So that was, that was very interesting. Uh, five star read highly recommend. The other five star read I have is uh, my life as uh, sorry, life as a unicorn by Amaril L. Cardi. Um, this was great. Um, I'm reading a memoir of a drag queen. I didn't expect them to be able to write, uh, and they can write. Uh, secondly, we have a gay Muslim drag queen discussing their life. I. I thought that would be super interesting. I didn't realize that if you took out all of that stuff, they would still probably have a life. Like they just had a very interesting life. This was powerful. This was great. I really appreciate how the author didn't pull any punches. I really appreciate how they said I was flawed and I was wrong when I did this. I really appreciated how they portrayed all of their flaws and it was almost like it was almost like we had an unreliable narrator in a non-fiction memoir who was aware of how unreliable they were things like the way their mother treated them was interesting and how that relationship evolved and it was just good i just i just really i, I think that this is such a wonderful such a wonderful book um and i think that everybody should read it it's you know you get to put yourself in the shoes of a muslim person who is gay who believes that their religion says that every gay person is going to hell but not just every gay person every gay person's mother is going to hell and they're trying to live a life where where they know they're going to hell and everything they do is a sin and it doesn't matter how good they live their life they're never going to be able to overturn that sin and and that but they know that they're gay and that that's who they are and so you know ultimately very depressed very fucked up person and and then super like just I don't, I don't want to say more. I want, I, I want people to read this book. I don't want to spoil what happens in this book. Um, there's bits that are hilarious. Uh, there's bits in this book that are hilarious. I very much appreciate the bit where they're picking on their Arab teacher. Um, uh, they move to London and they sort of forget how to speak Arabic. And, and so the mother hires them an Arab tutor and and the way they pick on their tutor is hilarious um the relationship between amaru and their mother is um that somebody should write that as a novel because that's excellent like i got everything i would get out of a novel out of a non-fiction book very highly recommend very good um great read um 
that's it. That's all the books I've read. Um, this has been thought provoking. This has been great. Uh, and, uh, what I'm now questioning is whether I should read more nonfiction. I mean, I should read more nonfiction, but whether reading a whole stack of nonfiction at once was excellent, or whether just sort of spacing it out throughout the year is the better tactic, but definitely want to read more nonfiction. Anyway, this video has gone for long enough. If you got to the end, please give me a like. Uh, I know that when we get to this point that, uh, you know, you probably want to comment and say something. If you don't have anything to say, just give us a smiley face or a thumbs up in the comments. Let me know that you're here and you watch to the end. Um, if you're new here, subscribe, ring that bell if you want to get notifications of everything Nell and I post. Bye. Thank you.